Welcome everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Not entirely sure where you are in the globe. Uh, welcome to this uh, second uh, sessions of parallel uh, sessions of the day. I'm Ruth Cairo. I'm the I'm going to be the chair uh, in this session. Um, and we have four super interesting presentations uh, on livelihoods and inequality. I think we're supposed to have a fifth one, and we are just hoping that the presenter is going to. Uh, show up uh, at some point. If you cannot locate it, uh, locate him. It just means more time for a Q and A. Um, so please use the Q and A uh, part of the chat to ask questions to the presenters, and we can have a bit of an interesting discussion at the end. Uh, that being said, I think we can start with the first presentation by Jemima. Hi everyone, I am Jemima Bada. Thank you all so much for making the time to attend my presentation today. In this presentation, I highlight how COVID-19 responses by the government of Ghana or GOG have been marginalizing for rural and farming populations using the Upper West Region as a case study. In the interest of time, I will skip the background information and go right to the inequalities of COVID-19 policies in Ghana. The full paper is published in the Journal of Agrarian Change, and so the more detailed discussions can be found there. The Upper West, Greater Accra and Ashanti regions were among the first to record COVID-19 cases, leading to partial lockdowns. As part of the lockdowns, the GOG banned airline travel and large gatherings. It also shut down schools and imposed restrictions on movement. While these strategies were to prevent public health challenges, they nonetheless resulted in weeks of hardship and uncertainty for many in the country. The lockdown was lifted in April 2020, but alternative interventions by the GOG were still marginalizing for agrarian groups. Agrarian communities are characterized by their rurality, low socioeconomic status, and heavy dependence on subsistence farming. The Upper West Region is a mostly agrarian society and one of the poorest regions in Ghana due to a myriad of historical, geopolitical, and environmental and other factors. Although other regions in Ghana record significant proportions of rural dwellers and poverty, the Upper West region is overrepresented in both counts. Now, I will discuss each of the response strategies by the GOG and how these are marginalizing for agrarian societies. The strategies are spelled out on the slides, so I will only talk about why these strategies are discriminatory. Strategy one was to limit and stop the importation of cases. In the early stages of the virus spread, much of the attention was on borders in southern Ghana. Testing and contact tracing were also lim limited to travelers arriving to the international airport in the national capital. During that period, the Hamley border, which connects Upper West Region to Burkina Faso, witnessed an increase in migrant and smuggling activities. Also, most inhabitants of the Upper West Region engage in internal migration to mostly rural areas of Ghana. Therefore, focusing solely on travelers arriving through the international airport neglects less privileged travelers who journey through other means. Strategy two was to detect and contain cases. As stated earlier, contact tracing in Ghana was limited to affluent travelers, despite evidence of other routes of transmission. Later, testing prioritized community hotspots. Focusing on identified community hotspots and imposing a lockdown in two metropolitan areas, while doing little to address the recorded case in Upper West Region, reiterates policy neglect of the region dating back to the colonial era. Moreover, encouraging enhanced hygiene and mandating quarantines and the wearing of masks presupposes the availability of spaces and resources to do so. This is not the case for the average Upper West Region dweller. This measure also does not account for the extra burdens that quarantines and enhanced hygiene add to women's workloads. Lastly, a COVID-19 tracker app is important, but exclusionary for people in the Upper West Region due to high rates of illiteracy, lack of electricity, and the fact that many in the region do not own mobile phones, much less smartphones. Strategy three was care of the sick. This strategy presupposes the existence of health facilities and workers, and is exclusionary for larger rural contexts such as the Upper West Region. Since first, many health workers refuse postings to the area, and the few trained in the region prefer to emigrate for better opportunities. Second, the doctor-patient ratio in Upper West Region is over three times lower than that of the national capital. Third, the few health facilities in the Upper West Region are under-resourced. As of June 2021, all COVID-19 testing facilities were in southern Ghana. 
4th, it was revealed that Ghana had just 200 ventilators to serve its population of over 30 million. Estimations suggest that there may be 10 or fewer ventilators for the entire Upper West region. Later, 10 extra ventilators were donated to the GOG, all of which were distributed within southern Ghana. Fifth and finally, the effects of climate change imply more complex infectious disease outcomes in the Upper West region. For instance, earlier in 2020, there was an outbreak of cerebrospinal meningitis in the Upper West region with an estimated 40% fatality rate. Despite this, governmental attention continued to focus on the national COVID-19 crisis with little attention to the double epidemic in the Upper West region. Strategy 4 deals with the impact on social and economic life. This intervention assumes a homogeneous living standard for populations across the country. Given the historical trends of poverty alleviation strategies in Ghana and the lack of details about the Coronavirus Alleviation Program or the CAP, it is likely that the northern sectors would receive minute portions of the CAP. Moreover, relief for health workers is effective only if health workers are available and have medical supplies, which is often not the case in the Upper West region. Additionally, only a few people in Upper West region operate businesses, hence an option better suited to certain such as the Upper West Region would be subsidies for smallholder farmers. Importantly, the absorption of water bills and rebates for electricity is perhaps the most discriminatory of all measures for rural dwellers in Ghana, considering that most of these communities lack both electricity and portable water. Strategy five was to increase domestic capability and deepen self-reliance. The Upper West Region has very few industries and studies show that most new businesses prefer to operate in Southern Ghana due to the area's socioeconomic and ecological advantages. It is therefore possible that the Upper West Region would not benefit from this intervention and residents may likely need to migrate to take advantage of this intervention in Southern Ghana. Potentially increasing out migrations and further widening inequalities between the northern and southern sectors. Similar to historical development patterns, it is also likely that no infectious disease centers will be set up in the Upper West region. In conclusion, COVID-19 has highlighted the stark local and global inequalities. With the sustained attention on urban centers and core occupations, it is important to examine how agrarian populations experience a pandemic. It is my hope that more studies will direct attention to these experiences to better center the needs of vulnerable rural dwellers. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Jemima. Uh, it was super interesting that this, uh, it was a printed presentation on how the ways that government tried to combat COVID-19 don't really reach uh, everyone in, in every place in the country. Um, so we, let's move on to the uh, next presentation. Uh, Kati, did, you man did we manage to, to find the other presenter? Is he online? No, she's uh, unfortunately online currently, so. Okay, no worries. Uh, so in that case, uh, we are going to Richard's pre Richard presentation please. Good day, everyone. In this talk, I'll be presenting some results from a recent paper examining how adolescents have been affected during the COVID-19 pandemic in four low and middle income countries. The data that we use in the paper comes from the Young Lives Longitudinal Study. Since the turn of the millennium, the study has been following two cohorts, the younger and older cohorts, in four low and middle income countries. Ethiopia, Peru, Vietnam, and the state of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana in India. The participants have been visited in person five times, most recently in 2016. But in 2020, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, Young Lives implemented a three-part phone survey. The second call, from which most of the data in this paper comes from, was implemented between early August and mid-October a time at which our younger and older cohorts were aged roughly 19 and 26, respectively. It's the 19-year-old cohorts that we focus on in this paper. As of mid-October 2020, the four Young Lives study countries had had very diverse experiences during the pandemic. As you can see in the figure on the screen, by the time that our second call was complete, the number of COVID-19 cases per capita differed dramatically between the countries, with Vietnam having been exceptionally successful at limiting the spread of the virus, and Peru being one of the worst affected countries in the world in terms of both cases and deaths per capita. The question is then, given these diverse experiences, how have adolescents fared in the four countries? 
Analyzing educational outcomes, we found that the ability con to continue learning remotely during lockdowns varied greatly by country. In Vietnam and Peru, roughly 80% of the 19-year-olds successfully engage with their school teacher through in-person or virtual classes or online assignments. However, in India, this proportion dropped to only roughly 40%, and in Ethiopia, roughly only one in every 10 participants managed to engage with their teacher during the stay-at-home requirements. We also found that in Peru, the country worst affected by COVID-19 cases, roughly 16% of the younger cohorts who were engaged in some sort of formal education before the pandemic had dropped out or chosen not to re-enroll by mid-October 2020. Analyzing time use, we found that participants reported spending more time on childcare and performing more domestic work than before the pandemic. We also have found that households have tended to resort to more discriminatory gender roles in times of stress, as the increase in household and caring responsibilities has fallen disproportionately on females in all four countries, while males have tended to work more in the family business. For example, looking at the bottom of figure one on the screen, you can see that in Ethiopia, roughly 70% of adolescent females reported spending more time on domestic work compared to just 36% of adolescent males. Looking at food insecurity, we found that around 16% of adolescents reported that their household had run out of food on one or more occasions since the beginning of the pandemic in Ethiopia and in India. Comparing this to figure two on the screen, you can see that this marked a significant movement away from the existing trend of food insecurity, with the proportion of households without food increasing by over 200% compared to 2016. Peru and Vietnam appear to, appear to have been less affected in terms of food insecurity. But beyond just descriptive statistics, one of the unique strengths of the multi-cohort Young Lives panel data is that it provides the opportunity to compare the outcomes of the different cohorts when they're the same age, but at different points in time. Previous Young Lives research comparing the two cohorts at the same age has shown that in the lead up to 2020, the younger cohort had achieved improvements in critical aspects of human development, such as height for age, school enrollment, and cognitive learning outcomes. Continuing this inter-cohort comparison, in this paper, we're interested in comparing the outcomes of the 19-year-olds during the pandemic with that of the older cohort when they were the same age, but roughly seven years prior in 2013. Formally to do so, we utilize a difference and difference approach, but we allow for differential linear age trends between the two cohorts. The equation we use is at the bottom of the screen here. One of our main outcomes of interest in this is subjective well-being. In all Young Lives rounds, subjective well-being has been measured using this Cantrell self-anchoring scale. This asks respondents to visualize a ladder of nine steps, with the bottom step representing the worst possible life and the top step representing the best possible life. Respondents are then asked to identify which step they think they presently stand on. Figure three on the screen here is showing the changes in the average step of the subjective well-being ladder over time for each cohort. And as you can see, it depicts that there's been a striking fall in the relative well-being of the younger cohorts when compared to the older cohort at the same age. Before 2020, the younger cohort had consistently higher well-being at the same ages of 12 and 15 in all four countries. This is now no longer the case in Ethiopia, India, and in Peru. The exception is Vietnam, the country that has been exceptionally successful at limiting the spread of COVID-19. Formally analyzing the results using our difference to difference framework, we indeed find that the younger cohort have experienced a significant drop in well-being relative to the older cohorts in Ethiopia, India, and Peru, but that there's been no significant change in Vietnam. When thinking about the channels as to why this may be, the descriptive results presented earlier already point to a number of areas of concern that could explain this fall in relative well-being, including worsening food insecurity and interruptions to education. And so just to sum up, in the paper, we find that in the pandemic year, the previous gains of the younger cohort in well-being has largely disappeared in all countries except Vietnam, the country that's been most successful at limiting the spread of the virus. Furthermore, 
Losses in educational enrollment and a shift towards more discriminatory gender roles have been seen in all four Young Lives Study countries. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for this presentation. It was uh, super interesting. It's, it's very related with uh, with our keynote presentation yesterday from Mariana Bandiera and uh, the big pool idea. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, the next one is by Mona Shifa. Virtual greetings to everyone and thanks for, for organizers for the opportunity to present our paper. My name is Mona Shifa. I'm a senior researcher from Sardru. The topic of my presentation is partial inequalities through the prism of a pandemic, COVID-19 in South Africa. This is a joint work by me and David from AFT and Professor Marie Lebrand from uh, Saldro. So the existing and growing number of research indicated that the adverse health impact of the current pandemic or other previous pandemics is not the same across population groups. In particular, there is evidence which suggested that uh, poor people and people with pre-existing health conditions are disproportionately affected by such pandemics. What makes the current uh, pandemic uh, different from previous ones is that uh, the measure introduced uh, to contain the virus. Many countries implemented uh, lockdown policies of different degrees, and these policies are implemented both in developed and developing countries alike. Uh, as a result of this, in addition to analyzing the direct impact of uh, the direct health impact of the pandemic, there are also research which try to look at to what extent household living conditions uh, allow them individuals to. Uh, to adhere to strict lockdown policies and to what extent household living conditions also allow them to follow WHO recommendation in order for them to prevent themselves from being infected by the virus. So the existing research indicated that individuals in poor countries have less capacity to deal with strict lockdown policies and also they have this less capacity to follow WHO recommendations. These recommendations include, for example, the ability to wash uh, hands with water and soap regularly, uh, the ability to implement social distancing, and the ability to get correct information about uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, our research is in line with uh, this kind of research, uh, but we provide more detailed analysis, uh, spatial analysis using South Africa as a case study. South Africa is a, an interesting case study in, in this regard uh, because uh, South Africa is one of the countries with high level of uh, national equality and high level of spatial inequality. Uh, South Africa is also one of the countries which is uh, uh, highly affected by uh, the current pandemic compared to other uh, African countries. So in terms of data, we use the 2016 community survey. This is the latest data set available for us to uh, estimate uh, living conditions uh, at lower geographic levels, such as municipalities. Uh, regarding vulnerability indicators, we follow uh, Gordon ETL's approach to uh, select uh, indicators. Uh, they provide a detailed uh, justification why they have uh, recommended these indicators. For example, sharing water uh, uh, sources and sharing a toilet with our other households increases the likelihood of being infected uh, from the neighborhood, person from the neighborhood. Uh, lack of access to TV or radio uh, limits access to information. Uh, living in large household is, makes it difficult to implement social distancing within the household if there is uh, one person infected by the, the virus, for example. Older people have a high uh, risk of dying by the, the virus, or they also can be adversely affected by the virus. Lack of a fridge in the household might increase the likelihood of going to shops to buy food items more frequently. This might also increase the risk of being infected. So we use these six indicators and we map if each indicator at different geographic levels and show the inequalities uh, across different uh, spatial units. And we also try to calculate uh, average vulnerability score uh, using the six indicators. We weight them equally and calculate a vulnerability score for, uh, at different uh, aggregation levels. Uh, we also use a counting approach. We count the number of uh, vulnerability indicators for each individual and aggregate that into uh, spatial units, different spatial units. So the first result is uh, uh, showed that the average vulnerability score at uh, province level at, at municipality level. So as we can see that there is inequality in terms of uh, average vulnerability at province level with provinces such as Eastern Cape, um, uh, KwaZulu-Natal, Pumulanga and Northern uh, Northwest provinces have high level of uh, average vulnerability. Uh, 
uh, also within uh, provinces, we can see also significant inequalities or special inequalities at municipality level. So we can see here uh, in Eastern Cape, there are areas which have which can be considered uh, highly vulnerable, while areas uh, with less vulnerability. So this uh, reflects also that uh, areas with high level of vulnerability also uh, are areas which are characterized by high level of poverty and uh, deprivation. So in order to test this, we try to uh, uh, analyze the relationship between uh, household wealth uh, and average vulnerability. So as you can see that uh, uh, in the in this graph uh, we have uh, on the x-axis uh, quantiles of household wealth and on the y-axis we have vulnerability index. So we can see clearly there is negative relationship between the level of vulnerability and uh, wealth quantile. So uh, in, uh, individuals or households in the first quartile have a much higher vulnerability, average vulnerability compared to individuals uh, at the lower, uh, at the higher quantile, quantile five. Uh, we, we do some kind, so the same kind of analysis at municipality level. So we calculate average wealth index at municipality level, and we also calculate average uh, vulnerability index uh, at municipality and so the, the, uh, run simple regression. And we find significant relationship between, significant and neg negative relationship between the two measures. So municipalities with uh, low level of average wealth have high level of uh, vulnerability. Uh, vice versa. So in summary, our uh, analysis showed that there is significant inequality, spatial inequality in terms of COVID vulnerability in South Africa because of households living condition. So this uh, uh, also indicates that uh, there is positive relationship between uh, household wealth status or income status and also uh, vulnerability to COVID-19. So the pre-existing socioeconomic inequalities translate into vulnerability to COVID-19. Uh, uh, so poor people uh, have uh, high vulnerability to COVID-19 because of their living conditions, and they are also more likely to be exposed to the virus because of their working conditions. They are more likely to use public transport. They are more likely to, to work in areas with, uh, with, with, which requires contact with other people. So because of this, this uh, has implication in terms of uh, exacerbating existing health inequalities. Uh, because pe poor people are also have a high uh, number of uh, risk factors, underlying risk factors for pandemics such as COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Um, okay, so I think we can move on to the last presentation by Vincenzo. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vincenzo Salvucci, and today I will present this paper on the impact of COVID-19 on consumption poverty in Mozambique. This is a paper that was written with Giulia Barletta, Finorio Castigo, Eva Maria Egger, Michael Keller, and Finn Tarp. In this paper, we do something relatively simple. We take some detailed estimates at microeconomic level obtained in another paper, translate them into impacts on consumption and poverty. And the way we do that is we take four sets of impact estimates taken from that paper by Beto et al. The impacts that we take are on wages, on sectoral GDP, on household income, and on employment. We combine these impacts and translate them into impacts on consumption and on poverty. We apply some consumption income, consumption wage elasticities, and play with impacts on employment. And in this way, we get simulated consumption estimates and poverty rates. Our results turn out to be very close to those obtained by the World Bank in their Mozambique economic update from February 2021. This paper was originally designed as a policy paper. It was requested by the Ministry of Economics and Finance of Mozambique. So it's not so advanced in terms of research methods, but hopefully uh, we hope it will be useful for policy purposes, especially. Now, we were lucky enough to have detailed macroeconomic estimates that were already available. They were obtained using a social accounting metrics approach, and we heavily rely on these estimates to compute the impact on COVID-19, on consumption, 
and no poverty. Now, Mozambique is a country that after 1992 achieved fast growth, rapid and strong poverty reduction from 70% at the end of the 90s to 46% in 2014-15, it still presents a strong rural-urban divide and a regional divide. Now, since 2015, several crises hit the country. And finally, in 2020 and 2021, there was this health and economic crisis due to COVID-19. The data that we use are from the 2014-15 Household Budget Survey that we call IOF 14. Now, as introduced, we assume that two main impact channels are at work a direct impact on income and wage, and we use the estimated macro impacts on wages, on sectoral GDP, and on household income. And two, the second channel is the channel of employment losses. And for this, we use the estimated aggregate impact on employment. The two are then combined to assess the final effect on consumption and poverty. The results are containing this table and table in the next slide. We have three different approaches and the average that we get is that consumption reduction was about 10% at national, but also at urban and rural level. Whereas the poverty rate increase is estimated to be about seven percentage points at national level slightly more at rural level and slightly less at urban level. This translates into about 2 million people at national level entering poverty in less than one year. About 1.5 million in rural areas and about half a million in urban areas. Now, even though the effect on consumption is similar for different education levels, we see that the effect on poverty, which is the blue bars, is much higher for uneducated people. And also we observe some differences for what concerns the, the, the impact on consumption and on poverty for people working in different sectors, working as traders, service, domestic workers, peasants, agriculture work. So concluding, we see that consumption may have decreased by between seven and 14%. Poverty may have increased by four, 10 percentage points from a baseline of 46%, depending on the approach. And this corresponds to about 2 million people entering poverty in less than one year. Now, the poverty results reflect the higher probability of falling into poverty for households in rural areas, people in subsistence agriculture, individuals with low educational attainment, family workers, domestic workers. Whereas consumption decreased relatively homogeneously across provinces more for small traders and also more for people working in agriculture, mining, manufacturing, construction, utilities and transportation. We also find that inequality increased, but only modestly. Now, COVID-19 certainly has produced a setback for poverty reduction in Mozambique and many more households fell into poverty or experienced a drop in consumption including household categories generally less vulnerable. Now, the longer term structural drivers of poverty seem to be still at work, but new drivers likely emerged. So for chronic poverty interventions, they should address the structural drivers of poverty and they are still important. At the same time, it is key to address these new drivers that were identified. Thank you.
Thank you. This was really, really great. I think it really highlights how the the effects of the COVID pandemic is going to they are going to outlive the pandemic itself. Um, so let's move on to the Q and A part of the session. Uh, we have a question for Jemima on the Q and A by Richard. Uh, Jemima Rich is asking if you have come across COVID policy uh, examples in other con countries that take gradient con conditions into account. Honestly, I haven't. Sorry, there was an echo. Yeah, I haven't. Um, and at the time that I responded, so um, this paper was part of a symposium by the Journal of Agrarian Change um, titled COVID-19 and the conditions and struggles of agrarian classes of labor. So at the time that I was, you know, writing the paper for the symposium, I did not come across any. Uh, this was in early 2020. Um, and when I was revising the paper around late 2020, um, there still wasn't much. There are some academic papers, but I have not come across um, um, any COVID-19 policy examples like, you know, that uh, intentionally, you know, consider the needs of uh, agrarian populations. Um, sorry, Katya, do we have the other speaker already? So we have her online, but she needs to request uh, to share the audio herself, and I don't see the request, so I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, in that case, let's continue with the Q&A for now. Yeah. Um, Jemima, so I think you, you mentioned that there was a, an increase in smuggling uh, uh, and um, I think it was smuggling and something else. And, and migrant, uh, yeah, smuggling and migrant activities. So it's a fairly small border compared to other borders. And so people are able to, you know, like, cross um, relatively easily but given that there was a pandemic and there were you know stringent measures to control movement um, you would think that you know some of those measures would apply to that border as well but there was nothing and so there was there was a news item about you know like some smugglers had been um, arrested at that border um, there was another new news item about I think someone um, from Burkina Faso had crossed into the Upper West region and they suspected that the person had COVID-19. And so, um, and um, among others, uh, we just, you know, went to show that there was very little attention being paid to that uh, border. I see, so it was basically a diversion from the main official border to the... Yes. Yeah, I see, yeah. Um, so, uh, Richard has another question for Mune this time. Did you look at uh, indicators breakdowns within the vulnerability index? And if so, was there one or two that uh, people were most commonly deprived on? In Mona, are you there? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> no worries. So yeah, we, we looked at, we also mapped the, each indicators uh, at various uh, special units. So the most, uh, uh, it depends also from uh, whether you are looking at urban areas, rural areas about indicators. For example, in some of the urban areas, uh, the indicators which are more uh, uh, important are sharing water, for example, is the, is the most uh, uh, people are most deprived in, ter in terms of that indicator because most people share e water, especially in rural areas. And the other one is also sharing toilet. Most people also in rural areas. So it depends where which uh, area you're looking at in terms of which indicator particularly is important in part that particular area. So we provided every, every indicator and we mapped it at uh, province, municipality, level, rural area, urban area level in the paper. Thanks. So I was wondering if you are planning or are going to look at the correlate, the special correlation between the vulnerability and actually COVID infections, and if you will see something with that. I think I think that would be very interesting. As uh, sorry, as an echo. So I think that that would be a very interesting future work 
uh, given that the, there's data availability. We were trying to do though, so since we have this paper, but there is limitation in terms of data sets, like we getting uh, COVID cases, uh, tests, it's because we have to control also for test patterns, because test patterns also vary across the space. So we're trying to get data set, but so far we are not succeeded in terms of getting uh, detailed uh, days, cases uh, at municipality level or than province level is not available. But if, if, if it's available in the future, we would like to do and push the paper. Thanks. Sounds good. Um... Richard, I actually have a question for you. I was wondering how, how much of the differences across countries that you see uh, can be explained by the COVID measures taken by the government or the, even the, the number of infections and how that is different from just the differences in initial physical capital. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a, a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's a great question and something that I don't think we can fully, uh, you know, ascertain the, the, the relative contributions of kind of COVID specifically versus any kind of general initial deprivations or socioeconomic progress. Um, yeah, the data we have just just doesn't allow us to do that kind of, you know, decomposition. But what I can say is that um, we I, I didn't present here, but some of the other results we look at in the difference in difference uh, framework are we formally look at educational enrollments, we look at uh, the proportion of job loss or loss of income, and we also look at uh, subjective wealth, kind of a Likert scale between one and six of your relative ranking of your wealth. Um, and we find consistently for all, um, all of our outcomes that e even in cases where all four countries are affected, uh, you know, un unlike subjective well-being where Vietnam wasn't actually affected, the magnitude of the deprivation is largest in Peru and smallest in um, Vietnam uh, by by quite a long by quite a long way of quite large magnitudes. Um, and so, you know, if if it was basing off kind of existing levels of deprivation, we we wouldn't expect to find Peru being very heavily affected as they're you know an, a, a low middle income country, say in comparison to India and Ethiopia. Uh, but we consistently find this pattern that Peru, which has been worst affected in terms of the COVID cases and deaths per capita seems to be consistently the worst affected in terms of the magnitude of the shocks. Um, also, just briefly uh, analyzing, we have a few indicators that we that we have recall periods on. Uh, so we asked, you know, what was the highest educational grade you achieved just before COVID-19? Uh, and what was your subjective wealth just before the pandemic broke out? And we consistently find that the countries that were doing well uh, such like Peru and Vietnam and even Ethiopia with its high economic growth had continued to do well right up until the pandemic. Uh, but then they see these large declines during the pandemic itself. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions from the audience? audience? Otherwise I have a, one for Vicenzo. Um, so, which is, I, th I thought it was really puzzling how the consumption, uh, the reduction in consumption was so similar between rural and urban areas. Uh, yeah, I was expecting that to be a, a much larger drop in urban than in rural, because I mean, usually the these sort of measures are targeted more to uh, urban areas and uh, rural ones are a bit less affected, like life goes on more or less as, as usual and people continue to go to their fields and plant their crops and whatnot. So I was thinking, uh, can you can you expand a bit on that, perhaps? Yeah, well, yeah. actually, I, I was expecting I was expecting the same. And uh, and indeed, when we use, um, well, there are also differences in the in the various approaches, for example, when we take uh, uh, sectors and we and we use uh, detailed sectoral estimates etc we find that for example yeah in in urban areas we have a bigger effect than in rural areas but then on average yeah indeed we find a a, a 10 percent decrease uh, at rural and urban level and uh well we think that okay the the, the, the even the 
urban areas were more affected than than rural areas especially in the beginning of the pandemic then the pandemics were spread out also to 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 other areas even though urban areas are still more affected than than rural ones then it, it well we think that okay it, it's really it really needs a small shock uh, in urban areas also to affect rural areas that depend a lot also on the fact that okay uh, the existence of markets for their products uh, the the existence of uh, well uh, the possibility to 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 have transportation or to get for example uh, inputs and and also, and also uh, well, f food becoming available from neighboring countries, South Africa, etc. So even a small shock for for rural areas can translate into into a drop into a drop in consumption uh, of a similar magnitude. Now, uh, let's also take into account that uh, that consumption levels in rural areas are much lower than in urban areas. So, for example, uh, if average consumption in rural areas is a, a, a five Metikaj uh, per, per, per day, for example, a drop a drop of ten percent in that case is half a metika, whereas, for example, in urban areas is about uh, twice as much. And and uh, so the, the 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 absolute reduction in consumption for urban areas was definitely higher. Uh, but yeah. Uh, it is it is surprising for us as well and that's why we 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 are expecting now to have actual data the the actual data for the household budget survey that was done in 2019-20 and to have a look at actual household data if this is the case or if our simulations are uh, are not very are not very correct and so we have to 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 to, to revise the model <laughs> One possible explanation that I was just thinking about is also has, uh, has to do with uh, remittances and the drop of remittances from the uh, urban to the rural areas. So basically just uh, the re repercussion of uh, this huge drop uh, in in uh, urban that spillovers to, to the rural ones. Absolutely, Absolutely. No, and you're definitely right. That 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 can be a channel, and even though uh, mobile phone uh, uh, transactions increased in a way, so so people from urban areas could send easily money to people in rural areas. Well, since they 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 got a bigger shock, then the, the amount that was transferred to rural areas, to rural areas was definitely smaller. Perfect. Uh, thank you, and I uh, hope to continue to see you in the other sessions in the conference, and we can continue to talk. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.